this point, I'm going to reconvene the meeting. Uh, we established a quorum earlier, and so unless there's any objections, uh, we will go forward. Uh, the first item on the agenda is House File 2908 with Representative Wills. The chair will move that House File 2908 be referred to the General Register. Representative Wills, welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. So House File 2908 designates an uh, a bridge in my district in Rosemount, Highway 52, County Road 42, uh, to be memorialized as Dennis A. Groth um, Bridge. And just a couple details about Dennis. Uh, he was born in 1947 in rural Rosemount and graduated from Rosemount High School in 1965. He joined the Army in 1967 and he was a dust off pilot. So you can see Dennis in the photo there. And then, um, unfortunately, Dennis and his crew died uh, in the early morning hours of October 19th, 1968, okay. when his helicopter went down in unknown circumstances in Sok Trang, Vietnam. They had just dropped off a wounded soldier, and he was only 21 years old. So Dennis's brother, Jerry, contacted my office uh, um, recently to uh, have this bridge memorialized in his brother's honor and for the sake of not printing out unnecessary paper this is the bridge um, that was just recently reconstructed last summer over County Road 42 it says 52 so October 19th 2018 would be the 50th anniversary of Dennis's death and so I think it's timely for us to Perfect. honor his memory and ask for your support for House File 2908. Uh, well, thank you, Representative Wills. Does anyone have any questions for Representative Wills on the bill? Representative Wills, can I ask, is there anything, um, was there any particular reason that this bridge was chosen um, as a, a memorial? Yes, and thank you for asking. It is in the uh, area close to where his family grew up. They had a family farm just about a mile west of there. Uh, he attended uh, and was baptized and confirmed and buried at St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church that's located about a mile west of this particular bridge. So the whole area is very important and has a lot of family history. Thank you. We'll see no further questions. Uh, thank you for bringing this bill. Representative Wills, uh, Chair will renew his motion that House File 2908 be referred to the General Register. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. House File 2908 is referred to the General Register. Thank you. Um, let's go with uh, Representative Fenton next. Representative Fenton, welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means. The chair will move that House File 3371 be referred to the General Register. Representative Fenton. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. And um, how 30, House File 3371 came about is um, there was a recent incident in the state of New York in which a young 18-year-old uh, girl was arrested by a police officer and unfortunately, um, after leaving his custody, had uh, reported that she had been raped. And the police officer had uh, said it was consensual. So upon hearing that, I went back and I looked at Minnesota state law and found out that it um, is not against the law here as well, just like New York. It is for correction officers, but peace officers were not a part um, of that. So what House File 3371 does is it creates uh, criminal sexual conduct offenses specific to peace officers. Um, and it as well um, uh, makes sure that a peace officer is not entitled to assert victim consent as a defense. So, um, and there is an exception in the bill to allow uh, for lawful searches. And um, 
with that, uh, there's no known fiscal impact for 2019. The bill would go into effect um, August 1 of 2018. There's no known fiscal impact in 18 or 19. Thank you, Representative Fenton. Anyone have any questions for Representative Fenton on the bill? Seeing no questions, any last comments, Representative Fenton? In the matter of brevity, thank you for your time, members. Uh, well, uh, with that, uh, members, I'll renew my motion that House Bill 3371 be referred to the General Register. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Most prevails, House File 3371 is referred to the General Register. Representative Lomer. The Chair will move that House File 2967 be referred to the General Register. Representative Lomer, welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you for taking your time this afternoon. Um, House File 2967 seeks to identify the connection between sex trafficking and pornography. And this bill originally had a fiscal note, but with the inclusion of Representative Pinto's amendment, a new fiscal note that shows a zero impact um, was generated. So I'd just like to move our, this bill, 2967, to be referred to the General Register, Mr. Chair. And I'll, I'll just say a little bit more about the bill. It, it's a really great bipartisan bill. We had a letter of support from a Ramsey County Attorney John Choi. Uh, we had great testimony from Sergeant Grant Snyder from the Minneapolis Police Department who's worked on sex trafficking for the past 20 years. And we had several women testify from Breaking Free. So it's a good bill. And Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Lomer. Does anyone have any questions for Representative Lomer on House File 2967? Again, House File 2967 was here because originally there was a fiscal note for it, but uh, an amendment uh, that was added in the last committee uh, apparently took away the uh, cost of the bill, and when the fiscal note came, it uh, now has a zero fiscal note. So. Uh, with that, uh, members, if there's no other questions, I'll renew my motion that House File 2967 be referred to the General Register. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. House File 2967 is referred to the General Register. Thank, Thank you, you Representative much. Lomer. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll take uh, House File 3232, Representative O'Neill. Representative O'Neill, welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means. The Chair will move that House File 3232 be referred to the General Register. And Representative O'Neill, I see there is an amendment. Uh, do you want to uh, have us deal with that amendment now, or would you like to first uh, present the bill? Mr. Chair, I would like for that amendment to be moved, please, and incorporated. Okay, uh, the Chair will move uh, the A18-0700 amendment and uh, is this a technical amendment, Representative O'Neill, or can you briefly speak to what it is? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. This actually does re uh, eliminate some redundant language and clarifies um, the language that's there. It also adds additional option to return any unspent funds to the customer if that is the choice of the agency. Okay, anyone have any questions on the 0700 amendment? Seeing no questions, all in favor of the 0700 amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails, the 0700 amendment is adopted. Okay, Representative O'Neill, uh, please tell us about House File 3232 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. House File 3232 amends the Solar Rewards Program through Excel Energy, and specifically it increases the amount from 20 to 40 kW of a project that's available for the program. Um, the reason it's in front of you today is because it deals with the renewable development account. And so um, I'm actually going to turn it over to my testifier to give you a little bit more background about the program and how the RDA is working. So that's a renewal, renewable de development account. Oh, well, welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means. Could you please state your name for the record and give us your testimony? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Reed LeBeau, and I'm here on behalf of Ideal Energies. Um, what this bill seeks to address is last year at the end of session in the supplemental budget bill, 
uh, the legislature eliminated the Made Minnesota program, and in doing so, took money from the Made Minnesota program and put additional funds into the Solar Rewards program. Uh, in doing that, uh, what we didn't realize at the time uh, during the end of session was that Made in Minnesota had a cap on the projects of 40 kilowatts, where Solar Rewards had a cap on the projects of 20 kilowatts. So we're just trying to have the policy follow the money that was intended uh, to fund projects within that program. That's all the bill does. Okay. Any questions from members of the author or Mr. LeBeau on the bill? See no questions. Uh, any last words, Representative O'Neill? I just thank you for your support today to move this forward. Okay, with that, I'll renew my motion that House File 3232, as amended, be referred to the General Register. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. House File 3232, as amended, is referred to the General Register. Thank you. Uh, finally, um, on the bill calendar, we have House File 2739, authored by Representative Hurthouse. Uh, Representative Hurthaus moves that House File 2739 be referred to the General Register. Representative Hurthaus. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, House File 2739 is a bill that uh, designates a portion of U.S. Highway 12 in YZ as Officer Bill Matthews Memorial Highway. And it uh, authorizes the memorial by uh, erecting a sign at uh, both the east and west end of approximately one mile section of US 12. Um, members, uh, I've been before the legislature in uh, lobbying for and getting uh, funding for improving the safety on Highway 12, and it's with regret that I am here offering this bill to memorialize uh, one of our public safety uh, individuals who was instrumental in helping reduce the uh, deaths and mortalities on this highway. The circumstances in which this happened uh, are a culmination of everything that could go wrong. We had a, a driver who was uh, uh, distracted by uh, making a statement that she looked up, which suggests at minimum that she was not paying attention to the road. Also, I uh, had uh, blood toxicity of, uh, of uh, chemicals and, and uh, drugs that were restricted, uh, driving on a revoked license and borrowing a vehicle. So everything that could go wrong uh, did, and that is no comfort to the family, but nonetheless, uh, Chief Riswald and, uh, and Officer Matthews' uh, co-workers uh, thought it would be good to do this. There is a small uh, cost. You've got a fiscal note in your packet. It's going to cost a couple of thousand dollars, but um, in our last stop in transportation finance, um, Mr. Matt Hagan, uh, president of the Minnesota State Lodge, had uh, testified that uh, they would be picking up the cost for this. So with that, uh, members, I ask for your support. Uh, Representative Carlson. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I'm just uh, curious, was the uh, officer, uh, Bill Matthews, from YZ or did the accident happen in YZ? I'm just curious as to why that one mile stretch in YZ. He is a, a police officer on the YZ police force and on uh, that day on September 8th, 2017, there was a call that came in. There was debris on the roadway in YZ on Highway 12. He went there to do a a rather mundane task of uh, implementing public safety and getting that debris off of the road, and he was struck by this driver. Yeah, so there's a real connection, Mr. Chairman, with yeah. Wyzetta. That's what I was curious. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Representative Carlson. Any other questions? Uh, Representative Markworth. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and Representative Hurtos, thanks for bringing this forward. You know, in mid-May every year, there's a law enforcement memorial day and recognition, and it's right well, right on the Capitol grounds, there's that memorial there. And so if you haven't had a chance to attend that, do that, because they kind of have a list of all the law enforcement uh, officer and personnel who've died in the line of duty, and it's very sobering. And um, so these type of recognitions, I think, are really important. Yeah. Thank you. Well, seeing no further discussion, uh, Representative Hurthaus renews his motion that House File 2739 be referred to the General Register. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. House File 2739 is referred to the General Register. Okay, members, that's the uh, calendar of bills for the day. Um, the uh, next and final item on the agenda is a review of uh, 
the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. I'd uh, ask Commissioner Tingerthal and anyone else she wants to present to come forward. Uh, members, uh, as you know, uh, early in session, I've tried to have reviews of different agencies and different subjects. Uh, last week, we uh, reviewed uh, the special ed program some and the uh, increases and changes that are taking place in that program, as well as some of the wastewater infrastructure costs around the state that uh, over overlap three different committees. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion in recent years and uh, more interest in affordable housing and workforce housing. And I thought it would be appropriate for us to bring uh, MHFA uh, here to talk about that and uh, also help us learn a little bit more about their budget, which is a rather different and unusual budget from most of the other budgets that we have. Uh, so with that, uh, Commissioner Tingerthal, uh, welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here today. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk a little more holistically about Minnesota housing. And uh, perhaps as you see things coming through uh, that uh, our request for funding, uh, it will help to have a little more context about the agency as a whole. Um, I'll start with our mission. Uh, we feel very strongly that housing is a real foundation for success for kids, for families, uh, that it's really, really tough to succeed in school or to succeed in life if you really don't have a place to call home. So because of that, we collaborate with uh, people, communities all over the state to create, preserve, and finance affordable housing. So that's what we're about. I want to take just a minute to talk about uh, how Minnesota housing is really different from every other uh, state agency, especially any uh, cabinet agency. We are an independent agency that was established back in 1971. And the reason it was established back then is that the federal government at that time had recently uh, created uh, tax exempt revenue bonds for housing. These are bonds that can be sold, and then the proceeds of those bonds can be lent to people for the purpose of affordable housing. And it was a pretty simple idea back then. And virtually every state in the union now has a housing finance agency where the, um, one of the initial roles for the housing finance agency uh, is to issue bonds. And uh, because of that, and at that time it was an unusual thing, uh, most of the state statutes, including Minnesota's, was set up so that the um, financing of the agency is protected on behalf of the bondholders uh, that might buy the bonds from the agency. And in fact, today, we have uh, about two and a half billion dollars worth of bonds that are outstanding to investors all over the country. And uh, because of that, we are subjected to a lot of oversight. Uh, we are annually rated by two of the um, national uh, rating agencies, both Moody's and Standard & Poor's. And we are rated on a standalone basis, separate from the state of Minnesota. And our rating uh, today is AA1, AA plus by those two rating agencies. We also have an independent board of directors. And if you were to look at the state statute that formed the agency, you will see that uh, the powers of the agency are vested in that board of directors, who then in turn delegate the authority to uh, the commissioner and uh, thence to the senior staff of the agency. We have uh, six appointed members of the board, uh, three from Greater Minnesota, three from the metro area, and they serve in four-year overlapping terms. Uh, we also have on our board the state auditor who serves as an ex officio member of our board. We use no state appropriations uh, to pay the agency's operating costs. Because we are authorized essentially to be a lending institution, we are allowed to charge more on uh, the loans that we put back out to the public than we pay for the cost of capital, much like a bank would do. Uh, that spread, if you will, is limited by federal regulations. And um, so we 
uh, pay attention to that and have to certify to the amount that we earn. State appropriations, because this state has chosen to give us additional powers uh, to run programs that are funded by state appropriations, uh, state uh, housing infrastructure bonds, uh, et cetera. Uh, state appropriations are about seven to 10% of our overall agency program budget, not our operating budget, but our program budget. And you're gonna hear a lot more detail about that. And just to give you a comparison to other things that come through this committee, our state appropriated budget last year was about 0.3% of the 18 and 19 general fund budget. Uh, Commissioner, before we uh, turn the page, can I ask you going back to the, uh, the spread uh, issue you talked about, I mean, how much money annually does Minnesota housing make on the interest rate spread, the arbitrage that you mentioned? Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't have that exact number with me. I'm happy to get back to you with that. Okay, do you have any rough idea? I do not, off, I wouldn't want to cite that off the top of my head. I'm okay, sorry. well if we could uh, get that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Certainly. Please continue. All right, uh, moving to the next page. Um, we are called upon by the various parts of our statute to serve a wide variety of Minnesotans with our programs. We start uh, at the lowest end of the income spectrum, those people who are either homeless or are threatened with homelessness, and serve people through a number of programs uh, with appropriated dollars to prevent homelessness before it begins. The median annual income of the household served by those programs is in the nine to $12,000 a year range. Supportive housing, this is housing that has some level of services and uh, it provides a permanent place to live for people, uh, just like another rental apartment might be, uh, but providing services either on site or connected through uh, social services to that housing. Again, the median income of people there is similar to those where we prevent homelessness in the nine to $10,000 a year range. We then move into affordable rental housing. That's the new construction or acquisition and rehabilitation of affordable rental housing, including workforce housing. And it also includes the preservation of existing affordable housing that has federal rent assistance attached to it. Median incomes of households served there is from nine to 40,000. And finally, we have affordable home ownership. This is first time home buyer loans, home improvement loans for low income households that already own their home. And we also have a small program for new development of single family homes where the funds are awarded on a competitive basis. There the median income of households served uh, goes up to about 69,000 depending on the program. Moving to the next slide, uh, program delivery. One thing it's important for you to know is that Minnesota Housing does not own and does not operate any housing. We work through partners in a network of private delivery partners across the state. For our single family lending programs, we have a network of banks and mortgage lenders that lend to the general public, to those first time home buyers. For our rental development programs, we work with private developers and private property managers to both develop the housing and then manage it over a long period of time. Uh, literally, the agency has been in existence since 1971. Probably our first rental properties uh, went on the books in around 1976. So there are properties that have been financed that long ago, more than 40 years ago, that are still under management by private parties that are receiving federal rental assistance. Finally, we work with social service providers uh, to deliver some of our homelessness programs, particularly uh, such things as our housing trust fund uh, for rental assistance. For those programs where funds are awarded to uh, lenders, we um, usually use a request for proposals uh, process because there are usually 
uh, there's usually way more need than there are funds available. We do have a few programs, including our preservation of properties that have federal rental assistance, where we will sometimes provide funding on an ongoing basis in case there's need for uh, dealing with a property that is changing in ownership. Overall, we have over 200 delivery partners statewide in these various programs. And Commissioner, maybe you're going to get into this a little bit, but when you talk about the uh, lending that you do, so I mean, if someone is going to, you know, build an affordable housing uh, project, and I know there's many different programs and all that, uh, is the money that you are lending lent to a private developer at a lower interest rate than they can get on the private market? I mean, is that why they are going to Minnesota Housing, uh, or, you know, what other? And if so, where is that money coming from? And maybe you're going to get into that a little bit more, but it seemed like an appropriate question to ask in this slide. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I do have a couple of examples at the end of my slides that I think might be the best place to okay. discuss the differences in the programs, because it varies depending on the particular program source. And I have a couple of examples that highlight that. All right. Sounds good. Let's proceed. Very good. So um, with a large number of funding sources that we are responsible for, uh, we have adopted a process of uh, developing each year an affordable housing plan. This is a plan where we lay out all of our programmatic funding and uh, tell the public how we intend to allocate those resources over the next year and the amount of those resources that are likely to be available. We do this uh, and we adopt a, uh, the plan for a, what we call our program year, which runs from October 1st to September 30th. Now you might ask, since the state fiscal year is July 1 to June uh, 30, why do you choose to use uh, what is essentially the same as the federal fiscal year? That gives us an opportunity to see if there are any new resources available uh, as a result of legislative action. And it also does represent the fact that a number of the resources that we're responsible for are, in fact, federal resources that run on the federal fiscal year. So every year we begin in May by going out to the public with a survey asking them where they might recommend any change in direction from our previous uh, affordable housing plan, where they think there might need to be more or less emphasis compared to the previous year. We then work throughout the summer to uh, look at the resources that we have available and take into account the uh, public feedback that we get. We then publish a draft plan early in August we uh, review it with our board and then we do a formal public comment period uh, that ends uh, usually at the end of August. We then, uh, if there are uh, changes that we want to make based on the public comments or based on feedback from our board, we then will uh, do a revision and we will then take it to our board in September uh, to be adopted for the following year. The final thing I want to pull your attention to is that we do a program assessment every year and we provide this to uh, our committees of jurisdiction. And what it does is it's a report card on how we did on the previous year's affordable housing plan. So it has exactly the same programs and it will tell you a number of things about how those programs were administered. Uh, how many dollars went out, what the average was for a particular program, uh, how many people in different uh, protected categories were served, uh, what the median income was of the people served by a particular program. Some of these reports are mandated by the legislature and for ease of reading and uh, resource, right. we combine them all into a single report and provide that in February of each year, giving ourselves a report card on how we did from the plan that ended the previous September 30th. On the next slide, I'll just show you a highlight from uh, the program assessment report uh, from 2017. And this is just one example of charts and graphs we have in the report. 
In this case, we're showing the number of households that were served in different categories. So nearly 70,000 households received one type of assistance or another uh, because of the programs that are administered by Minnesota Housing. So I won't go through everything, but the first couple of big categories. Uh, rental assistance is far and away our largest category. This includes both state-funded rental assistance as well as federally funded rental assistance that we administer under a contract with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, serving almost 31,000 households. And we then, is that Section 8 then, or are there other, is that what's included there? And how do you compare to like Minneapolis or other local units of government that also administer those sorts of programs? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, it is, uh, part of that is referring to Section 8, and um, for the purposes of this program, this is uh, what are known as project-based Section 8 uh, certificates. And those are uh, back in the mid-70s. The uh, federal government, the way that they had of doing uh, federally assisted rental housing was to sign a contract with a private owner and manager, and then they agreed to continue to provide the difference between the market rate for the property and the amount that the family can afford to pay. Uh, and so it is an ongoing process for those properties to um, have the owners collect data on the residents, calculate how much rent is owed on an annual basis, and then uh, file for with the federal government for that amount of rental assistance. So it's a, it's a fairly complicated process. And uh, for about the last 20 years, the Department of Housing and Urban Development has contracted with housing finance agencies to, to administer that particular portion of the Section 8 program. Minnesota Housing does not administer the ongoing tenant-based Section 8 program, that is done by local public housing authorities uh, in Minnesota. So okay. that's the distinction. We do in this category also uh, administer uh, what we call the housing trust fund that is uh, funded with state appropriated dollars. And that is um, overseen by us, but administered by social service agencies <coughs> and housing and redevelopment authorities that have contracts with us and that is a tenant-based voucher program. So the, um, the dollars are provided um, where that tenant has chosen to live. So we do administer that program as well. Uh, to give a little bit of a summary of what you would see in our program assessment report is again the number of households served, uh, the number of rental housing units that were financed in our uh, 2017 program year, the number of mortgages that were provided through our single family program. Uh, just a couple of highlights there that the uh, median income of home buyers was about 54,000. 32% of those households in 2017 were households of color. That compares to the private mortgage market at about 11%. Uh, total resources that were provided in 2017 was just over a billion dollars. And in that particular year, 62% of the funds that were awarded on a competitive basis, so rather than on a uh, market flow basis, but on a competitive basis through an RFP, were awarded outside of the seven county metro area. Excuse the, me, I have a question from Representative Detmer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioner. Um, of the, of, on this slide, of those households, uh, we're assuming that there's at least one or two maybe with that have an income coming in, personal income, jobs, or how is that? How do you track? How do you track that? Um, Mr. Chair, w Representative, which, which number were you referring to? I'm just looking at that that page, that slide. Is there is there some there that not, might not have an income coming in? Um, Mr. Chair, Representative, um, we do 
Uh, for our lowest income programs, you will often have people who are limited to uh, maybe veterans benefits or social security, um, very, very low income. Um, certainly for our uh, mortgage programs, we are uh, looking to make sure that there is sufficient ongoing income, almost always employment uh, that is available to that household to be able to continue to repay that mortgage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Commissioner, I guess I've got a couple of questions on this page too. First of all, in terms of the, the 4,035 mortgages, I assume those are all existing homes. We're not building any new homes with mortgages from the department, um, or are we? Uh, Mr. Chair, there is a small percentage of uh, the homes that are uh, purchased by uh, individuals and families who receive a mortgage from Minnesota Housing who do move into a new home. Um, with the fact that the home building industry has not been building a lot of starter homes in recent years, really since the Great Recession. Um, it is definitely a small percentage. Uh, we'd love to see that be larger, uh, but that is not what the uh, home building industry is uh, building right now. Okay. And Commissioner, can you break, I'm sorry, Representative Hurtaus? Go ahead. Oh. Then I'll... Commissioner, can you break down the 2,767 units of rental housing a little bit more? I mean, is that all brand new rental housing or is some of that uh, renovated rental housing and um, can you talk about a little bit you know is it in the metro or greater Minnesota can you tell us a little bit more about that um, Mr. Chair I would be happy to provide to the committee a more detailed breakdown of those particular numbers um, we do not include that breakdown in our program assessment report, but we do have uh, we do have that broken down and can certainly provide it to you. Okay, I mean, do you know offhand how many new units of rental housing are are financed within that? Because I know that you do. I know you're involved in new rental housing as well as grant programs to private landlords to remodel, you know, existing housing. Um, Mr. Chair, it really does vary from one year to the next, and um, that's why I wouldn't want to answer um, specifically without having the numbers in front of me. We're happy to provide that to the committee. In more recent years, uh, because of the fact that there has been a need for new housing, uh, we have, uh, in our scoring system, have really uh, tended to favor new construction and uh, we have done a larger percentage uh, in each of the last uh, subsequent years. Immediately after the Great Recession, I would say it was much more heavily tilted towards rehabilitation because there just wasn't the demand for new housing. And what we found is that developers seeking the resources through uh, our agency are very attuned to the marketplace and they have responded with a good deal of new construction as uh, a result of um, that demand in the marketplace. Okay, but this, you know, when I see 2,767 units of housing financed, I mean, you know, statewide that's not a lot, especially if, you know, a certain amount of its renovation. I mean, if you, and maybe you're going to get to this in your, your presentation later, but if you um, if you provide a uh, you know a loan to a developer that builds housing, you know, and there's like let's say sometimes there are multiple streams of uh, financing in some of these. If you provide I don't know 30 percent of the financing, uh, you're counting that as rental housing financed, even if you're not necessarily financing all of it. Is that fair to say? Um, Mr. Chair, yes, that is correct. Um, we have always taken it as a responsibility, uh, especially to take the appropriated resources or the capital resources provided by this legislature and make sure that we leverage those resources by bringing in uh, private lending dollars, bringing in tax credit equity uh, from private sources, bringing in uh, the local match. In fact, uh, if I, 
I, I do have a slide coming up, and we can uh, we can jump to that now if you would like to. Um, well, we can we can wait on it. I've got Representative Hurtaus wants to ask a question here too, so I've got to get him in. Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, uh, first, a comment. Uh, I I heard you say that um, basically new construction isn't interested in building entry level homes. That's not quite a correct characterization. The market makes it difficult to do that because the price of land is so expensive, particularly in the, in the metro area and the, and the exurban areas, the developing fringe. Um, generally, when you build a home, about 25 percent of the, of the cost can be attributable to land with regard to appraisal and underwriting purposes. So when you have 80, 90, and $100,000 lots, even far out as uh, the areas that I represent, um, that dictates a minimum of $400,000 housing and up with regard to the price. My question revolves around the uh, rental uh, production, new construction and rehabilitation. It's come to my attention in my own district that I think it is with the assistance of your agency that we're building new homes in a very expensive market where the value of the homes are in that three hundred fifty to 400000 but the people renting in those units are only paying about $500 a month rent. And I don't think it's necessarily the best use of limited resources to be building expensive housing to provide shelter, because that's our, our primary goal. But my question with regard to the rental production is as they've uh, revealed some of their business models, how much of this uh, rental production is in the form of grants to these companies that are building this product? Uh, Commissioner. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, uh, we provide virtually all of the dollars that are what might be referred to as gap financing. So that is dollars that can stay with the project as long as it remains affordable. We provide that in the form of a deferred loan. So if that housing should cease at any time to be affordable housing within the requirements that they agree to, uh, that money needs to be repaid to the agency. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll um, <clears throat> I'll share some of these business models uh, later on. Okay. okay, please proceed, Commissioner. And I think why don't you just go through your presentation? We'll we'll get to those other examples. I I see they're coming up. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, on the next page, uh, we have a chart really showing that we have a wide variety of sources of funds. And uh, so for the um, resources that we made available, you see that the largest portion does come either from bond proceeds, that's the sale of either tax exempt or taxable bonds, uh, and then relending those bond proceeds, or from selling mortgages uh, in the capital markets when that is the more advantageous way to go. But all in all, 60% of the capital that we provided, either single family or multifamily, uh, came from that source. About 5% in 2017 came from state capital investments. That would be housing infrastructure bonds or general obligation bonds approved by this body. About 8.3% state appropriations, 18.4% from federal resources, and that uh, includes both the rental assistance program that I uh, mentioned earlier, as well as uh, the federal home program, which can also be used for gap financing for uh, rental properties. Then the last two uh, wedges that you see are agency resources. Now those are resources that are available to us from earnings or from um, you know, repaid loans from uh, previously retired bonds. And uh, there are two kinds, and I'll be talking in just a second about what the differences are between those two. So on the next slide, we refer to agency amortizing resources. These are what are sometimes uh, referred to as our pool two resources. This is essentially the resources that we have available that we can relend out 
um, for our various uh, statutorily approved uh, activities. Uh, and they can be made on a repayable basis at an interest rate. So these are basically amortizing loans uh, that we're able to make and recycle through our balance sheet. It is these resources that the rating agencies look at to make sure that we have sufficient capital to meet the ratings requirements. And so we go through testing in all of our outstanding uh, bond resolutions and our balance sheet to make sure that we have essentially uh, not only more assets than we have liabilities, but also a cushion of uh, loans and capital that is not pledged to the directly to the repayment of bonds. So it's really the way any bank uh, or lending institution would look at their balance sheet and make sure that they have sufficient capital. Then we have agency deferred resources, and this is sometimes uh, referred to by us and others as our pool three resources. These are resources from the actual earnings of the agency that get transferred every year after we complete our financial audit and can be used for making deferred loans or very occasionally grants. Um, we use those uh, again for uh, activities that are authorized by our statute, uh, but that um, maybe have more demand uh, than we have resources from state or federal sources to be able to fulfill. And um, what I'd like to do at this time is take you to the other handout, because I think it will make uh, a lot more sense if we can uh, look at the sheet, the black and white sheet that you have uh, at your places. It's separate from the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. This is an example. This is our current affordable housing plan budget summary. So I spoke earlier about the fact that it represented, that 2017 represented about $1.1 $1 billion. If you look at the first column of numbers, you will see that in 2018, it's a similar dollar amount that we are currently in the process of putting out into the community. What you see down the left side of this table is our major funding programs. These are all programs that are authorized by our statute, and they are grouped into several categories. Across the top of the spreadsheet, you see the different resources that we use uh, to fund those programs, and the numbers that you see throughout the matrix indicate which programs are funded by which resources. If I could take you back to the bottom line again, the $1.1 $1 billion is made up of six different pots of money, if you will. The federal resources make up a little over $200 million. And that is the major part of that is the Section 8 rental assistance that I spoke of earlier. State appropriations make up 93 million, and that includes nearly $9 million in repayments of loans that um, have where the property has refinanced, where the homeowner has sold the home any case in which we are able to re, uh, recapture those dollars and put them back out into the programs we're authorized to uh, do. In this particular budget, we have a state capital investment, which is GO and housing infrastructure bond proceeds uh, for 57 million. Uh, Agency bond proceeds, which is primarily our single family mortgage program, but also our rental mortgage program, is $676 million. Again, that's made up of tax exempt, taxable bonds, and also some sales of uh, assets into the capital markets. Our housing investment pool, so again, those are amortizing loans 
that we make from our balance sheet is at 59 million. And, la and in this particular year, the housing affordability pool is at $33 million. So those are, again, dollars that are earned from our other activities uh, that can be put out into programs. Okay, excuse me, Representative Hurtos has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I got a little ahead of myself and the commissioner answered my question in her detailed oh, okay. explanation. Thank you. Well, can I ask, uh, Commissioner, then, you know, I, people have sometimes described to me that this sort of, you know, is a bank or operates like a bank. When I look at uh, Pool 2 and Pool 3, um, so I, I don't know to, to what extent when I look at these numbers, you know, how much of this is sort of an annual or appropriation or annual resources uh, that are coming in, for example, the state appropriations, you know, or maybe our biannual um, for, the, for the biennium, or how many of them just sort of carry over from year to year. I mean, the 59 million and the 34 million, are those just sort of investment pools that the state has? Uh, to back other uh, funds, or, or what is, you know, where is that money? What is it? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for that question, because it does get quite confusing. Um, these dollars represent the number of new lending we anticipate doing during the 2018 program year. So, for example, uh, if you look under... Um, the category of home buying financing and home refinancing. You see a line item that says monthly payment loans. That's a form of down payment assistance that gets repaid by the borrower on a monthly basis. And you see a dollar amount of 11 million. That is the amount of new monthly payment loans that we expect to make during the course of this program year. So on our balance sheet, since those are amortizing loans, I don't know what the current dollar amount is, but we may have uh, 40 or $50 million worth of those monthly payment loans. And of course that number changes every month because we're getting payments. And so um, it is a program that is very much a revolving pool with payments coming, going in and coming out but this is the amount of new originations we expect to make in this program year. And Commissioner, are those new originations, I mean the funds for those, do those just come from the earnings that uh, Minnesota Housing has built up over the years or are some of those from, it looks like it's not federal resources because you've got a different column for federal resources. I mean, is this just sort of the capital that you've accumulated over the years that you're reinvesting? Mr. Chair, yes, that is correct. So, I mean, the, the agency has been uh, uh, running a balance sheet and incurring debt and, and uh, creating assets for 40 years now. Right. And so um, it, you know, it's our, our charge to manage that, those assets and liabilities on an ongoing basis. We do forecasting, for example, uh, to determine when some of those liabilities will be repaid. We forecast how much production we think we will uh, be able to support. And we do all that in advance of proposing a plan for the coming year, because uh, we don't want to tell the public we're going to have more resources than uh, we think we can actually support. So for 2018 in Pool 2, your is it fair to say that you're projecting that you have $59 million of uh, revenues coming in from old investments and loans that you've made that now you will be relending out uh, for other purposes? Um, Mr. Chair, that's correct. Okay. Okay. And is it the same thing for Pool 3 then? It, yes, Mr. Chair, that's correct. Okay. Then I've got Representative Vogel. Oh, I guess, did I ask your question? I did. Okay. Representative Hurtaus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And you were kind of going there too. And we, we've heard that the agency has been around for 45 years. And uh, we see uh, uh, budget sheets, but my curiosity is, you mentioned the term balance sheet. Do you have any balance sheets you're sharing with the committee? I'd be interested in uh, knowing what, what percent of the housing stock in the single family and rental market has got underlying financing from this agency. 
Um, I, I guess, Commissioner, do you have a, I assume you have a balance sheet or a statement of financial position you could provide the committee to? Um, Mr. Chair, we do have uh, audited financial statements, which includes our entire uh, $3 billion worth of uh, assets. And um, it is, uh, it, it is a uh, robust um, set of reports uh, because it includes all of the bond resolutions with all of the debt that's been issued by the agency, which is about two and a half billion dollars worth of uh, various bonds over the years and all of the, you know, cash flows from those bonds, et cetera. Uh, we uh, generally uh, present a summary version of that to our board of directors on a quarterly basis. And uh, we would certainly be, um, be happy to do that. Uh, we have, you know, historically more reported to uh, the legislature on programmatic spending uh, since it is appropriated dollars and capital dollars from the legislature uh, that are generally the subject of um, our dialogue with the legislature. But, you know, certainly our, our financial statements are fully audited, they're, they're public information and to the extent that the committee would like to have a walkthrough of those, um, we'd be happy to do that. Uh, Representative Hurtos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, yeah, I, that would be interesting to see that because, um, you know, as mortgage-backed securities that these are in terms of uh, first mortgages and real property, it'd, it'd be helpful to understand uh, what penetration you have into the private housing market with your dollars. I'd, I'd like to understand what, what that ratio is. Commissioner, um, Mr. Chair, we can certainly um, we can certainly provide the number of uh, single-family mortgages, for example, that are currently outstanding, and we'd certainly be happy to uh, use some of our uh, data resources to just maybe give a snapshot of the number of mortgages that were originated in Minnesota last year and what percentage um, we originated. My recollection from our research director is it's somewhere in the vicinity of 5%. Okay, um, Representative Hurtas. Um, yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I understanding that this is a agency that's been around for a long time, we in the real estate industry know that the average person tends to move on about every seven years. And so you're getting, uh, you know, mortgages that are, are being paid off and you're putting that money back into the pot. But it'd be uh, helpful to understand, you know, exactly what the depth of that is in terms of market share or market value, not just numbers of, of mortgages you have, but, but what's really, you know, on the books in terms of the collateral that is there uh, and, and to what, what loan to value ratios you're carrying uh, would, would help be helpful to understand that. Well, Commissioner, yeah, if you could, I guess, provide that information, uh, the statements. I don't know if it's available in electronic form that we could uh, email it out to people because I would guess it's a pretty large uh, volume of paper. But I, I don't think we're going to have a chance to have you back here again unless there's some other uh, bill that particularly affects you. But if we could get that, we could distribute it to members. Certainly, Mr. Chair, and uh, if Representative Hurtas would be uh, willing to talk with us about some of the things that he's particularly interested in, we can make sure we're being responsive uh, because I, I'm not sure that our balance sheet per se will exactly tell the story, um, but we do have other disclosure reports. Uh, for example, our, our, our bond investor dis disclosure reports, which would get into uh, things like loan to value ratio and, and such like. Representative Hurtos. Thank you. And one last question on the other section down on the bottom of your um, plan budget summary. There's this little item there called Manufactured Home Relocation Trust Fund. I've heard uh, a number of stories and issues about some recent um, mobile home park closures and about the adequacy of this fund. Uh, can you comment uh, on to uh, the adequacy of that fund and whether or not uh, monthly fees are uh, appropriate for the remaining people that are members of these home mobile home parks in, in order that this fund can deal with relocation when it comes about? 
Uh, Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Representative Hurthouse, um, the Manufactured Home uh, Trust Fund is a fund that was created by the legislature and is administered by Minnesota Housing. It is a, a statute that provides for the charge on an annual basis of $15 per manufactured home lot. And currently the law um, provides that when the collected fees from the lot owners uh, total $1 million, that there is then a click off provision that the following year after it hits a million dollars, there are no fees collected. And that was lowered to a million dollars uh, back just a few years ago. Um, the governor's uh, supplemental budget package does include a provision to institute an increase in that cap up to $3 million. Uh, and we requested that and the industry is in fact requesting that because a uh, million dollars doesn't go very far if you happen to have a year in which you have a couple of major park closures like we had last year. So the fund uh, fell to a very low level. Uh, it only replenishes at the level of about 400,000 400, a year. And so it takes two and a half years to get back up to a million. So we're really hoping that the legislature will look at that, um, uh, look at that bill this year because we think it's uh, the million dollar click off is just too low a level. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I would agree. Uh, Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Commissioner, good to see you. Uh, before I forget, um, if you get a chance, can you text me or call me tonight? I have a question for you. I don't want to ask. I don't want to ask in public. That sounds the wrong thing. It's not like that. <laughs> it's just whatever. Forget it. Um, yeah, just stop. Exactly. Um, huh. um, <laughs> no. um, was there any unused carry forward of tax exempt bonds uh, in the last cycle? And if so, how much was it? Uh, Commissioner? Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, um, Representative Garofalo, we did not award entirely the amount of housing infrastructure bonds. I believe. With tax exempt. Oh, I'm sorry, tax exempt bonds. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, there was no carryover at the end of 2017. Okay. And Garofalo. And Mr. Chairman and Commissioner. Um, can you just briefly talk about what effect, if any, the federal tax reform is going to have with regards to your operations and the tax exempt status? Um, I'm not fully up to speed on that, so. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Garofalo, um, it was 2017 was indeed a very interesting year in Congress with tax reform for tax exempt bonds. Uh, when the House uh, proposed its tax reform bill, it eliminated uh, what are referred to as private activity bonds, of which uh, tax exempt bonds for housing or um, volume limited bonds are a portion. And uh, just to give the um, committee members some uh, context, uh, Minnesota receives about $550 million of tax exempt bonding authority, which can be used for housing as well as some other limited opportunities uh, on an annual basis. There is a statute that sets forth the process by which that $550 million is allocated out to Minnesota Housing, the City of St. Paul, the City of Minneapolis, Dakota County, and then the balance of the fund is administered uh, in a application process at the Department of Management and Budget. And um, had the House bill passed, um, that would have wiped out that particular bonding capability. Um, it did not pass. The Senate bill uh, included the retention of private activity bonds, and so we anticipate no changes going forward. Um, related to uh, private activity bonds, there um, is a type of bond for rental housing that carries with it a, the right to apply for an allocation of 
low income housing tax credits. It's referred to as the 4% tax credit um, because it, uh, of the level of funding that it provides. The, um, there was a provision in the recent omnibus bill discussions in Congress that would have actually fixed the percentage of those tax credits at 4%. Currently, it's a calculated amount that's lower than 4%. That also did not pass. So we're kind of, after several ups and downs of uh, what might have happened, it did, uh, neither of those changes was made. Representative Garofalo. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner, so with the lower rates, I know sometimes you guys will, um, you'll sell the bonding authority to private agencies or to other agencies, your tax exempt bonding. Sometimes you don't issue them all, you sell some of them, right? Mm -hmm. Commissioner? Re Mr. Chair, Representative Garofalo, no. Okay, so what, uh, Representative Garofalo. I guess I won't ask what it is that I'm thinking of that <laughs> you guys are selling, but okay. But the fact that the rates, the corporate rates now and the income rates are lower, doesn't that render the, um, the tax exempt status less valuable? Uh, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative uh, Garofalo, um, I think I understand now the question. Um, when we issue bonds to raise capital to relend, um, they are sold into the capital markets and there is some concern uh, that with lower corporate tax rates, since corporations are some of the buyers of these bonds, that there may be less appetite for tax exempt bonds in general. We have not seen that show up in the marketplace yet. Um, there's some belief that it may cause um, yields uh, to be a little bit higher on tax exempt bonds. Again, we have not seen that yet, uh, but that I think is what you're referring to. And Mr. Chairman, just this is- Representative uh, Rafflo. Uh, so the committee chair has jurisdiction over this, so I apologize for the series of questions, but just to make sure. No, that's fine. Um, Regarding the Manufactured Home Relocation uh, Trust Fund, um, you mentioned raising the cap and um, is the administration have, if we were to find a revenue, general fund revenue source to immediately provide a surge of funds into that and raise the cap, does the administration have a position and if we use existing resources as opposed to um, the existing fee to increase the solvency of that fund? Is there, a, do you guys have a position on that? Uh, Commissioner. Um, Mr. Chair, um, Representative Garofalo, um, it's not been posed to us before. We'd certainly uh, be happy to take a look at it if it were posed to us. Thank you. And then uh, we can just we can just loot commerce again. That's all right. We'll just do that. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner, um, with regards to you know manufactured homes, trailer parks, uh, it's one of the best things we can be doing is preserving our existing housing stock. Uh, but a lot of these places, uh, they have infrastructure that's old, needs replacement. In terms of, from the legislature's perspective, if we're going to incentivize and replacing that infrastructure so that we can keep these affordable units uh, in place, what, in your opinion, what's the best way for us, what's the, what's the best existing program for us to kind of provide assistance to maintain that infrastructure, to provide that infrastructure funding to keep these mobile, these trailer parks or manufactured home parks open? Commissioner? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Garofalo, um, there is a program that this legislature approved uh, two years ago called the Workforce Home Ownership Program. And uh, it added a section to our statute that allows for the use of funds uh, appropriated to that statute to be used for uh, infrastructure for manufactured home parks. The amount appropriated that year for the program was $750,000. And we did in fact run a request for proposals. We received four proposals. Two of them were actually for infrastructure for manufactured home parks. So those uh, properties are underway. Um, it is my understanding that this year uh, there has been a bill introduced, not by the administration, uh, but by um, other parties that would uh, provide a funding source for that uh, same program. And that funding source would be an increment in the mortgage uh, registration tax over the current levels, I believe for the next 10 years. So that uh, I know is a proposal that's out there. 
and Mr. Representative Garofalo and to Commissioner and I just want to make sure I'm thinking about the right program we just funded that on a one-time basis there's no appropriation for fiscal year 19 correct Mr. Okay, Chair sure. Representative Garofalo yes that's correct okay thank you Commissioner and uh, Commissioner before we move on uh, from kind of this uh, black uh, handout that you had going back to housing investment fund uh, pool two and three which I guess you know are pretty much you know pools of money that we've got to uh, you know uh, build affordable housing and some of the other purposes you've talked about how large are they I mean if I see 59 million dollars in housing pool two is that you know a billion dollars in total assets in that particular pool uh, how much in terms of assets do these two pools have um, Mr. Chair again I would need to get back to you on that because um, you know some of uh, some of the resources in pool two um, they fluctuate from time to time so I'd want to get back to you with a uh, an answer on that uh, the uh, housing affordability fund pool again um, those are almost entirely deferred loans so while you will have a dollar amount that are um, a list of the deferred loans which might be quite large the repayment on those loans is a relatively episodic with the um, exception of our uh, deferred payment loans for home ownership where those are paid whenever a home is sold so given the number of mortgages we've made there's some uh, repayment of those on an annual basis it's not terribly large but it is uh, certainly a relevant number so we can certainly uh, provide that information to you and I would imagine that for pool two and pool three are those linked to like the uh, agency bond proceeds uh, in terms of oh by the rating agencies saying well you've got to have a certain amount of uh, cash or assets uh, in pool two and pool three to justify the uh, bonding that the agency is doing mr. chair yes that is absolutely correct so the process that we use is that every year um, we complete our financial audit that's usually done by the end of August uh, we then apply the rating agency standards uh, for the amount of required capital and if uh, there there is uh, uh, excess capital that's not needed in pool two we it is at that point in time that we move uh, the portion that's available into pool three for new lending but if there was a I don't know if you had a a, a deficiency or a default for some reason of a, let's say there was a big housing downturn and you had a big default of uh, loans in pool two that were made to build various uh, low-income properties that now for whatever reason can't meet their mortgages would that cause some of your bond proceed your your uh, the bonding you have to go into default I mean because you wouldn't have enough capital I mean is that a I mean, I'm sure you manage that sort of risk but is that a potential risk um, mr. chair um, it's less a risk than it has been in the past up until 2009 the agency did in fact hold as assets whole loans so mortgages that uh, were um, just mortgages and um, we did in fact in the Great Recession experience some uh, losses from foreclosures and then the sale of real estate owned properties however we reserved for those and um, we did not um, suffer any non repayment on any bonds because of the fact that we do hold these loans a certain number of loans as capital in our pool too that's that's really what they're there for and so it is those tests about the uh, adequacy of capital that are the main subject of the rating agency tests that are performed each year on us and that's why we have a rating of AA1 AA plus because of the level of those reserves uh, that are available okay well thank you um, I, I might I might add that since the recession we changed our process while the loans that are funded with our proceeds are still made um, to borrowers in Minnesota we now choose 
to take those loans and put them into mortgage-backed securities that are guaranteed uh, typically by uh, Ginnie Mae and or by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. And so they are marketable securities that are much more liquid and much better protected against the event of default. Thank you. Representative Hertzhaus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just uh, circling back with regard to your comments about the manufactured homes, did I hear you correctly say that the annual contributions were about $400,000 per year? Uh, Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Representative, yes, that's correct. Okay, and Mr. Chair, then if I divided that by $16 a lot annually, that means <laughs> there's approximately 25,000 mobile home lots out there statewide. Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, that math would be correct, and uh, we can verify for you from our records. And Mr. Chair. Representative Herstoff. Uh, just throwing an idea out, but with regard to the infrastructure for these aging mobile home parks, this looks like the very reasonable mechanism to uh, build that fund up and be able to use some of that proceeds or interest to service the debt on your bonding authority to go in and fix these things up. All right. I, I don't think we've got any questions at the moment, so Commissioner, we're going to let you keep going here. All right. Well, um, I may have exhausted everyone on the uh, black and white chart. Uh, if there are those of you who have questions about any particular funding source, but we thought this was the clearest way. Uh, I, I know it may not seem simple, but it is a pretty simple depiction of the various resources and the various programs that we are charged with administering. I'd like to uh, wrap up our uh, presentation and then uh, take any other questions you have by reviewing just a couple of details. Uh, the first is, uh, I know that this legislature has been particularly interested in making sure that we are developing uh, workforce housing, especially in greater Minnesota. And over the past five years, the state has provided resources that has allowed us to fund more than 1,900 units of both rental and home ownership new construction workforce housing uh, in the state. Uh, this includes the program uh, that was previously located at DEED and is now being administered by Minnesota Housing. But I, I want to emphasize that this is new construction housing. And you can see on the page that we have helped to support developments in every corner of the state in uh, a number of um, communities that I know you've heard from, Thief River Falls, Roseau, Worthington, Jackson, uh, just was in Austin last week, um, up in Lutzen, uh, the uh, recreation industry. And um, just last week, we approved uh, five projects, which are included in these numbers, uh, for another 191 units in Laverne, Baudette, Albert Lee, Pelican Rapids, and Duluth. And that's from the first round of workforce housing dollars uh, that with the program that was transferred to Minnesota Housing uh, last year. Um, and out of resources, not directly um, resources, we provided, uh, provided by the legislature for workforce housing, there were another 195 units that could be categorized as workforce housing in four developments in greater Minnesota. So that's in addition to the deed program. And Commissioner, can you say, I mean, how, how were these workforce housing projects built in terms of what was MHFA's involvement? I mean, are they, are they low interest loans that encourage developers to build them or, or what are you actually doing to help encourage them? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, there are typically a number of resources uh, that are provided and uh, we typically will provide an allocation of tax exempt bonding authority, which we talked about earlier, which brings with it 4% tax credits, 
which allows the developer to go out and syndicate those tax credits and raise equity. We will typically also put money from the challenge fund, which is one of uh, the programs funded by this legislature into that. And then there will typically be a first mortgage. Sometimes we provide that first mortgage. Sometimes the owner prefers to seek a first mortgage somewhere else. And then as required by the challenge fund, there is always some source of match that might be from the local community, uh, sometimes using uh, tax increment financing, sometimes using community development block grant dollars, number of sources that can be brought from the private community. Also, uh, often we have dollars from uh, local employers that are being brought to the table. So it, it, it often is a combination of funding sources uh, to make these programs work. Okay. On the next page, uh, I wanted to give you an idea, and uh, here's what, where we'll get into uh, some of the detail that you asked for earlier. In 2017, uh, we made our RFP selections in October of last year. We received $164 million in requests for deferred money. That's what I referred to earlier as gap financing. It's the amount that the developer cannot get from either equity, which is usually coming from low income housing credits, or from debt that the project can support. So it's that layer in between that's needed to close the development uh, budget gap. And uh, that is the most precious resource and the most sought after resource. So we received 164 million in requests and were able to fund 62 million of those requests. So nearly three times as many requests for funding as we were able to fund. We use a uh, scoring system uh, to help um, set the level at which the priorities are met for the state and choose those with the highest scores. Um, we made a total of 126.6 million in various investments. And I'm gonna give you a breakdown on that. This gets to uh, your question, Mr. Chair. So of the 126 million, 62 million was deferred funding that uh, was primarily either challenge dollars or uh, housing infrastructure bond dollars or uh, dollars under our preservation program, the tariff program. About 30 million of that was first mortgage financing that we provided. So that's from that pool two balance sheet financing. About 4 million came from a couple of our uh, groups that uh, provide funds through our RFP, and that's primarily um, DEED, uh, provides some community development block grant dollars through this process. The Greater Minnesota Housing Fund, which is a nonprofit organization that gets dollars uh, to provide to projects, and also the Metropolitan Council has some competitively awarded dollars that they do through this RFP. So that's four million. 130 million of the 346 million in total development costs was provided through tax credit syndication. So that's either our 9% or our 4% federal credits. And 72 million was provided from other sources. So that would be either uh, loans from private lenders, uh, equity investments locally, uh, local government uh, deferred loans or grants, um, any other source of funding was $72 million. So overall, um, Minnesota Housing provided 126, and that yielded a total development cost, so total construction costs and acquisition costs of $346 million worth of activity last year alone. So that is, gives you some, uh, some level of, of scale. There were also a few uh, single family uh, programs that were uh, funded about 10 million in deferred loans and about 500,000 in partner funding, much smaller program than our rental program. 
Finally, I have a couple of uh, project examples. Uh, the first one is what I would call one of our simplest uh, type of uh, projects, and that is uh, the 15th Street Flats in Wilmer. Uh, this is, again, a project that was awarded funds through our consolidated RFP. It's 47 rental units. It includes one, two, and three bedroom units. And as part of wanting to uh, get points to be selected, uh, they are going to serve uh, five people who in the past have experienced long-term homelessness and five people with disabilities in this property. Uh, the funds that are needed for uh, this are a relatively small first mortgage at about $1.2 million, and that will be made by Minnesota Housing out of that pool two balance sheet account. And $8 million in equity raised from the sale of 9% federal tax credits. You can see that um, the incomes that are served uh, in this particular community go up to about $42,000. It's a relatively low uh, median income. We're required by the federal tax credits to keep those rents affordable to 60% of median area income. So we don't drive where those uh, levels are set that's driven by the median area income. If you turn to the next page, we have a slightly more complicated example. And this is a project uh, that will be under construction in Moundsview, uh, construction of 60 rental units. And again, uh, includes units for four people with disabilities and includes one, two, and three bedroom units. Here you can see that the incomes, because it's in the metro area, go up as far high as $56,000. So here, uh, what we are providing is a $1.7 million uh, deferred loan from the Challenge Program, uh, about $200,000 in rental assistance. This is a program that we administer uh, uh, for people with disabilities, and those are federal dollars that are administered by us. Uh, the Metropolitan Council is making a $500,000 deferred loan for this project. There uh, is an estimated $3.7 million in tax credit equity, and that would mean that we awarded tax-exempt bonds uh, in the amount, full amount of the development costs to this project. And uh, we also uh, anticipate that there will be a $7.5 million loan that will be originated by a third party lender. In this case, the borrower chose not to uh, borrow from Minnesota Housing, but is borrowing uh, in the private market instead. So um, in answer to your question several times, uh, Mr. Chair, about how we put our sources of money into projects, um, every one just about is a little bit different. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Let me ask you on, and I think we're just about ready to wrap it up, but um, you know, one thing I hear from people when I go to like the Wilmer project, for example, I mean, you know, private developers I know in St. Cloud say that if they're building market rate housing right now, it's maybe 105, 110, $120,000 a unit. You know, I look at the development cost here and, you know, we're at like 190 some thousand dollars a unit. And I know that there are, you know, different issues in terms of perhaps re construction requirements or such. But, you know, generally speaking, it seems like when we build these, it does cost a lot more per unit than just a private developer would do if they were building market rate housing. Can you talk about why that is? Um, Mr. Chair, generally I can um, say that um, we did an hour with our committee in the Senate uh, talking about just this issue because we too are very concerned uh, that um, we are doing everything we can to contain costs. That said, I will tell you that um, there are things about the federal low-income housing tax credit, both in the way the program is structured and in the demands of investors who are willing to put that uh, $8 million into Wilmer that do tend to drive up the per-unit development costs. 
One of them is the fact that there are um, uh, a lot of lawyers involved in uh, doing a tax credit syndication. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the way the federal tax credit program is built, it really, um, it really causes you to build a developer fee into the total development cost that's often paid out over time, but because of the way the tax credits are calculated, it's advantageous to build that developer fee into the total development cost, so it makes it look higher um, than the cost uh, generally. Those costs would be taken out by a market rate developer. They would be taken out of cash flow over time, where in the way the tax credit is built, it really is advantageous to the community and to the developer to build it in up front. Also, these developers are on the hook for 30 years. Uh, I'm sorry, both the developers and the investors. And so they are really going to look at what they need to put into the property to have it maintain over 30 years because they're gonna be limited in the amount of rents that they can charge. And they may run the risk over time that rents are going to stay stuck because incomes haven't gone up in a particular area, but the operating costs are going to go up. And so they will often build in more durable products so that they don't have to count on cash flow to be able to do the maintenance on those properties. So those are just some of the key factors. We'd certainly be happy at some point to uh, provide the um, information and testimony that we provided in the Senate if that would be of interest. Thank you. Representative Carlson. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I know you want to wrap it up. I just have a quick question. If you could explain on the uh, Moundsview uh, project, the uh, rental assistance, 209000 is that an annual number or just what are we talking about? Because it looks like it's listed as part of the total cost of the facility, but if it's rental assistance, I assume that must continue on into future uh, fiscal years. Um, Commissioner. Mr. Chair, yes, Representative Carlson. Um, that is, in fact, a, a one-year number, and um, it will be continued for as long as the federal program continues. It's a program called the 811 program, and it is specifically rental assistance for people with disabilities. And um, uh, we hope that it will continue into the future. If it was discontinued, uh, we would certainly um, allow the developer to no longer rent those units uh, to people with restricted incomes. So, Mr. Chairman, and that, that's a sub I was assuming that was for the building, and uh, but then it would be for those four units that you reference up above there if it's people with disabilities. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Representative Carlson, yes, that's okay. correct. Thank you. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for being here and your staff. On the Wilmer Project and the Moundsview Project, you've got some units that are set aside for people with disabilities and uh, people uh, who are long-term homeless. How do you arrive at those numbers and, and how many, for the number of units in each of those projects that are going to be set aside? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, um, Within the scoring system that we set out every year uh, for developers, it's a public process that we uh, discuss and take public testimony. Um, there are different tiers of number or percentage of units in a building that will allow you to get a certain number of points in the competition. And so um, the number of four units in the or of five units in the Wilmer project, given that it is a 47 unit property, probably got it into the second tier in number of points. The four units in the um, 60 unit project probably meant they were in the first tier, so they probably got fewer points than the Wilmer project did. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, points are one thing, but what is the local demand? Uh, you know, for example, we've had the conversation about what happened in Roseau with, with some of the units that were set aside uh, for low income, uh, and it caused some problems. So 
I, I understand the points, but how much input does the local developer or the local community have in arriving at those numbers? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Representative Fabian, it is entirely um, at the option of the developer whether they choose to include a commitment to do those units or not. We do quite a thorough review of their supportive housing plan uh, because we really don't want those units if they don't have appropriate services linked to them. And so we evaluate that plan. There generally uh, is pretty extended conversation with the local social service agencies. And, um, but it, again, I want to emphasize, no one is forcing them to put those units in. They are choosing to put those units in and then develop a supportive housing plan that we review as part of the underwriting. Representative Hurtos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, on the Moundsview example, you have met council investment, $500,000. Some of the uh, city council meetings that I've attended when it called for met council investment really wasn't a direct aid or dollars. It was oftentimes waiving all of the water access charges and the sewer access charges, the whack and sack fees for each of the units. Is that what you're representing here? Is that typically what their contribution is? Commissioner. Mis Mr. Chair, Representative, no. In this case, um, they have a couple of different programs uh, that they utilize, and this one is actually a deferred loan. It's actual uh, cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, uh, in these other circumstances when they're doing that, that is really a shift, not unlike property tax, where the... Uh, Met Council puts forth a budget every year to uh, maintain the infrastructure of the sewer and water system. And when they're handing out free passes to a number of units, that's just a shift to the remaining property owners uh, who own homes. My second question, Mr. Chair, um, I realize that part of your budget is for financing of uh, individual homes for people to purchase. Of the rental market, are there any stipulations or do we create a ladder for people to lift themselves out of poverty and to uh, afford them an opportunity to get ahead and then they have to leave or are they allowed to be here in perpetuity? Uh, Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Representative Hurtas, I can talk about um, tax credit housing. Again, this is a federal program and it was really designed to uh, develop properties that were very much um, uh, similar to market rate properties with rents set uh, at rates that are affordable at 60% of the median income. And so um, those are not necessarily deeply subsidized rents in, in most parts of the state. And so um, I would say to move into a new tax credit property unless you have some form of rental assistance that you're getting through another program, um, that you know would be like any other market rate property that you would have the incentive to perhaps become a homeowner, perhaps move to another property. But there's no requirement uh, that people move out once they have qualified at that income when they move in. Representative Hurtos. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, in that instance, it seems like it could be somewhat of a disincentive to take a higher paying job if you have to pay your own rent to the full market rate. Thank you. Commissioner, um, I, I've got a question when you're done, but uh, do you have any other uh, things on your presentation? Uh, Mr. Chair, no, I think we've uh, completed our presentation. Okay, well, thank you, and thank you, everyone, for your patience. I guess the last question I had is, do you, um, for your plan in the year coming up, uh, you mentioned, you know, maybe 1,900 units you're hoping to do in the workforce housing area. Uh, do you have a uh, idea of how many affordable housing units you're going to be involved in financing or have a goal of financing in the next year? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, just a, a slight correction. The 1,900 units of workforce housing was the amount they w we did in the last five years. Excuse me. Okay. Um, just, just to be clear. Um, 
we have uh, just begun to put together our request for proposals that it'll be released in April uh, and we'll indicate at that point uh, what resources we anticipate might be available. Um, I would uh, venture to say that the number uh, will be um, largely determined, uh, not largely determined, but somewhat determined by what this body decides to do about a capital investment bill. Uh, because we do have a large request uh, for housing infrastructure and general obligation bonds, uh, which are both used for predominantly for rental housing. And Commissioner, I mean, I guess I, you know, is there, other than the, uh, the bond covenant issues where I'm sure you've got some extra, extra money set aside, you know, when I go back to like housing investment fund pool two or something i mean have you ever thought of just taking a chunk of that money and using it to build additional affordable housing um mr chair uh generally the the shortage of resources is not in amortizing loans that there there is plenty of capital in the marketplace for loans that can be repaid and that's the kind of loans that we can make out of pool two uh, and so uh, we would be happy to do more lending but what generally is the case the thing that's keeping uh, housing with affordable rents from being developed is the shortage of either equity or these gap resources for which we had three times as many requests uh, last year as we were able to fund and so uh, we um, we have an open uh, pipeline request for um, uh, amortizing mortgages, and we do look at applications from time to time, particularly for uh, loans that may be on older properties that need to be refinanced. Um, we have made some uh, of that resource available for lending to what's called naturally occurring affordable housing uh, through a, uh, an investment program. So we're, we're always looking for opportunities, but in our experience, it's not normally the amortizing repayable mortgage that's in short supply. I guess my, what I guess I'm getting at though, commissioners, let's say that there is a billion dollars in pool two and it's generating $59 million a year of uh, revenue I mean what if we just sold a hundred million dollars of the billion dollars of loans you've got uh, now you've got an extra hundred million dollars in Minnesota housing why don't we take that hundred million dollars and build some more housing well mr. chair most of the resources the assets that are in pool two are accompanied by a liability so if we sold the loans, we would have to uh, pay, use the proceeds of that sale to pay off the investors who provided the debt for making those loans. Mm -hmm. The amount that is free and clear, if you will, uh, is what we use to meet the asset tests and the capital tests for the rating agencies. So everything has to be in balance. So even though there might not be liabilities against those. Those are the assets that were required in order to meet our capital tests. Right, yeah, no, I know you've got to have a, a significant amount to meet the capital tests. I guess I was just looking at seeing if there were some additional resources that could be accessed, and I'm sure you've got, you know, more money than you need to, to meet the capital tests. Um, but, uh, but anyway, uh, any uh, representative vote? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, I, I had to sit here and I always penciling numbers. And you said you had three billion in assets and two and a half billion in debt, so that would be 500 million in capital, giving you about a 16 percent capital ratio. So I think that's what you're getting at: yeah. is do we really need a 16? If indeed my numbers are right, three billion, two and a half, 16 percent, do we really need 16 percent capital ratio to? To, to, to please Wall Street because, you know, most of the, uh, the financial industry, the banking industry is operating at less than 10. Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Vogel, um, there are a number of different layers. Um, n not only do we have 
assets on what you might think of as our balance sheet, but we also have uh, assets and liabilities within bond resolutions. And those bond resolutions not only have to meet capital tests today, but they have to meet stress tests over the period during which both the assets and the liabilities will be, um, will be outstanding. And there are a series of tests that the rating agencies require us to make assumptions about defaults, about prepayment speeds, that um, and we're required to meet every one of those tests. So the tests may seem um, overly conservative to you and me, but within those bond resolutions, there are points out in the future where under certain stress tests that we're just barely above the minimum. So it's not just a straight asset liability um, capital ratio, it really is also um, these ongoing tests that must be met in the bond resolution. Representative Houseman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, just wanted to um, give a, a, wor a word of praise about um, the department and the commissioner and how fortunate we are. I've had, because I of my work on the, the bonding bill and the capital investment committee, I've um, been at many of these events and have met many of the developers, property managers, social service providers, the nonprofits. And the, um, and the regard with which um, the department and the commissioner are held is really uh, amazing, um, that, that working relationship over time. And the head of the Greater Minnesota Housing Fund at one point talked about how fortunate we were as a state because he, in his work across the country, he knows uh, that what we have um, to take advantage of it here in the state really doesn't, in, it doesn't exist in a lot of other states. And so um, I uh, just, just have to say we, we have something going here that um, people all over the state and all of those 200 uh, partners are appreciating. Thank you. Well, it doesn't sound like there's an easy answer to the question that Representative Vogel and I were posing. I mean, I guess... And maybe that's something that we could look into more with the information you send us. I mean, it just does, you know, it, uh, I am curious as to, you know, how much of a surplus, so to speak, there is if we wanted to just dedicate some of the extra capital we have, if we have extra capital, to, to building more affordable housing. But that, uh, I don't think it sounds like it's easy to get that number right now. Um, so uh, any other questions for the commissioner? Well, with that, Commissioner, thank you very much uh, for taking your time and staying late. Thank you, members. Uh, appreciate it. And with that, the members' uh, meeting is adjourned.